there is just so much stuff to think about when you are planning or executing your retirement plan. So much stuff. And it can get overwhelming. And that overwhelm can steal your chance to rock retirement. I don't want to let that happen. I'm guessing you don't want to let that happen. So we need to figure out how to deal with that. Welcome to the show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host, and this is a show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but to really have the confidence to rock retirement. And if you want to have confidence in your retirement plan, you're going to have to master the fundamentals before you get into all the fancy details about retirement planning. If you get the fundamentals down, you're going to have a solid foundation to deal with all the uncertainty that you're facing. And that's what we're going to focus on this entire month on the show, mastering the fundamentals of having a retirement plan that you can have confidence in executing. Now, the reason we're going to do this is one, it's a five-week month, so we got some room to talk about this. And two, we talk a lot about about the concepts and answering questions and talking about pie cakes or fundedness ratio plan of records. And we talk about them in these little segments, but rarely do we start at the beginning on the first brick of the yellow brick road and talk through the journey from the beginning all the way to where it ends. And so that's what I thought we could do this month. So we're all on the same page and everything can make sense. And you understand some of these terms that we talk about. And bluntly, if you already get all this, big thumbs up to you. But you know what? The fundamentals are so key, it doesn't hurt to review them because one of the risks are if you're very sophisticated and you've already really gone through a lot of this stuff is that you forget the fundamentals and you get attracted by the the shiny object. So I think this is a healthy exercise for you as well. Now, the fundamentals are as I see them from all of the education I've had, from being a certified financial planner, from teaching retirement planning segment of the CFP curriculum. Uh, from having a retirement management advisor certificate and being on the committee for the curriculum for future RMA certificate holders through walking life with hundreds, if not thousands of people as they've made this journey in retirement over 30 years. I think about this stuff all the time. This is really important to me. So this is my view from what I've learned. That's what I try to share to help you have that confidence. So why is this so important? Why is it so important that we master these fundamentals? Well, let me ask you a question. In retirement, do you want to prosper? You're going to be like, yeah, of course I want to prosper. Okay, if you want to prosper, what does prosper even mean? I've been just recently getting into etymology, which is the sort of the history of words and where they came from. And prosper comes from an old Latin word, prosper. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly because I don't know anything about Latin. Prospear, which means essentially according to expectation or according to one's hope. If things happen according to one's hope, they are prospering. That makes sense to me, right? So what does it mean to have hope? What is hope? Well, from my readings, hope has three components. Number one, to have hope, you need to have an inspiring goal about the future, right? Rocking retirement, having a great retirement. You need to have a goal that inspires you, but having that enough is not enough to have hope, right? Because that's just a wish. You need to have an inspiring goal. And secondly, you need to have agency. You need to feel like you have some ability to act to make this inspiring goal happen. Okay. So you need to have a goal, need to have the ability to act. But then the last thing you need to really have hope is you need to have pathways, you need to ha- have see some path you could start on to use your agency to reach your goal in order to prosper. You following me? These fundamentals are all about building those three things, building an inspiring goal, retaining your agency, your ability to act, and then having a pathway that you can feel fairly confident that if you start at the first brick, you can get there. That's what these fundamentals are all about. And that's what we need to make sure we are focused on. Okay. So that's what we're going to build over the next four or five weeks. Today, what I want to talk about is how we go about this. Not just simply what we have to do, but how we go about doing it. 
And as a classically trained retirement planner, having taught the process that is used and taught to CFP certificates, I feel that it needs an update. Because the financial planning process tends to have a couple of things that I don't think are very healthy to give us hope so we can prosper, especially around retirement. Number one is the process is very cumbersome. It tries to build this all-encompassing plan all at once, you know, looking at all the different aspects of financial planning, but also using very, very long-term assumptions and focusing on the long-term a little bit too much. You know, if you use a Monte Carlo scenario and you're looking at a high level of confidence in order to not run out of money when I'm 90, which is a lot of times what we're worried about. When you're building a retirement plan, generally the focus starts to become, will I run out of money? And you look at all of these uncertainties and in order to protect against all these uncertainties, you end up building an overly robust plan to protect against not running out of money when you're 90, which is admirable. You don't want to run out of money. I agree with that. But the problem is the focus is so much there. We forget about our life. We forget about the trade-off of if we are so focused on not running out of money 90, well, I can easily fix that. You got to work longer. You got to take more investment risk. You got to save more and probably spend less now. Any combination of those things are really going to help the future. But the problem is you don't live in the future. You live now. So the traditional retirement planning process solves for the future, but that really costs you or potentially costs you your life right now. So you can have the false sense of security. You'll be good later on. And as I've walked this journey for over 30 years, dealing with clients, what you see is that we're always worried about the future, but then there's this tipping point. And I've encountered more people this way that are in their 80s. 70s or 80s, where they've gotten to the point where all of a sudden they're looking at, wait a second, I'm going to have way more than enough money. And when they see that, they start to think about, well, what could I have done? What could I have done in my 60s and my early 70s? You know, my grandkids are grown. Everybody's gone. I don't have near as much energy. And now I'm going to have more money than I'll ever need. So they overshoot. And I think that's a big risk with traditional planning. And the other issue I have with how we go about retirement planning traditionally is that, and this is just the nature of the industry because the process was built by practitioners that were financial advisors, insurance brokers, stockbrokers, everything is focused on investment products and investment returns as the hub of everything. So the conversations always end up becoming just trust the long term. When we're under time to stress, just trust the long term averages of the market. Or, no, you better not spend that money because we're worried about this later on. Becomes a very one-dimensional math problem that just asks you to have faith that the long run will work out. That comes from a good place, but it's not very empowering. There's not a lot of agency. And just trust me. Yeah, just trust the numbers. Yeah, slow down your spending. No, you can't buy that because I'm worried about your 90-year-old self. Just trust the numbers. That's not very empowering. So no wonder we are so worried. We feel like we're at the mercy of the markets and the economy, and we don't have any ability to actually work towards our inspiring goal. And we don't have a pathway that we have confidence in. So I think there's an issue. And the other part of it is that with traditional retirement planning, because it's so bloated and there's so much going on that we don't want to revisit it a lot because it's one, it's cumbersome too. It's not very inspiring or engaging. And so we end up having less and less meetings and just sort of hoping that it all works out. I don't like that model. So the way I would suggest that you'll go about this and what we preach and talk about here is, and this is what I use in my own practice, is I think we need a more agile approach that gives us, helps us define that inspiring goal, gives us agency and helps give us pathways so we can manage as life unfolds. And so what we, what I would suggest is you do use an agile retirement planning approach. And so what do I mean by that? So agile comes from project management world. It's a methodology to achieve an objective, whether it's building a stadium or building a software project that is very lean. So it tries not to try to figure everything out 
all at once. So uh, you know, the analogy I always use is the old traditional way, if you think of software, it's we all have, remember uploading CDs onto your computer when you're trying to install Microsoft Office? Remember, you'd have like 20 CDs and you just sit there and you download it and download it in this big cumbersome piece of software. Well, that was developed using the traditional approach of project management called uh, Waterfall, where they tried to figure everything out at once. And then it was very cumbersome to get in. So as a result, when there were bugs that they had to correct or features they wanted to add, you really couldn't do it because it was so cumbersome. That's how I think of regular retirement planning. An agile approach focuses on the main objective. It really focuses on what's the minimum viable product focus on the one thing I'm trying to solve. And then it iterates or makes little additions, fixing bugs and improving features in a very quick fashion. And I think that's what you need to do in your approach to managing all of these fundamentals. The objective is to solve the most important issues. And by doing this, you get into a rhythm to be able to continue to refine your goals and your dreams and to continue to refine what you have in terms of resources and constantly make it a more robust plan. And it becomes much more engaging. And most importantly, it helps you feel or helps increase the agency you have, the control that you have over your retirement destiny. I like a project where we focus only on controlling the things that are actually controllable, which is how all the little conversations that we have. So let's talk briefly about some of the principles of an agile approach. Number one is an agile approach accepts that you can't figure it all out. You can't figure out what the markets are going to do next week or for the next 20 years or inflation. Honestly, you and I can't figure out what our life is going to look like a year or two from now. There's so many outside forces. So unlike traditional retirement planning, where there's so much focus on trying to dial in what's going to happen 20 years from now, we just accept, hey, we can't figure this out. So we're going to just be very quick in how we react to things and continually improve the assumptions that we have. We can't figure it out. So we got to manage the uncertainty through frequent discussions. The second is you want to have collaboration in an agile project. It's not like a traditional project where you give all the information to someone else. They go up to their ivory tower and they come back with the answers for you. It's rather than have it be a delegation to someone or something else, it's no, hey, I need to one, use the strengths that you have in your life to inform the decision making. And then you find the software or the podcast or the advisor that has experience in walking the journey. And together you work and be creative together to come up with joint solutions. The next principle is you you realize, hey, we got to be really flexible here. We don't have to figure this out all at once because you can't. And since we're focusing on what we can control, we want to value optionality or having ability to make little changes because we recognize the world's going to change. My life is going to change. And I want to have enough flexibility to be able to handle those curveballs. Next principle is prioritize. You know, we talked about how there's so much that you have to think about in retirement that you can't do it all at once. And it's very easy to focus on the wrong things. Mentally, if I always close my eyes and I think of a dashboard and there are all these levers that can have an impact in my life. And some of them are really sexy and they sound really important when we read about them, but they're really not that fundamental. I'll use Roth conversions as an example, because that's something everybody loves to talk about. Now, there's value to Roth conversions potentially, but unless you have the fundamentals now, you look at the dashboard, you see this big, cool, bedazzled lever that says Roth conversions and you pull it and it doesn't have that big of impact potentially on you prospering. But then you have these dull levers that aren't near as attractive, these fundamentals that we'll be going through. Those can have a huge impact on whether you prosper or not. We need to make sure, you need to make sure, that you are focusing on the things that can have the biggest impact for your life. And so we want to prioritize those. And then the last principle I'll talk about from an agile approach is we want to have communication. Really, the right communication. So if you're doing this on your own, and we've recognized that we can't figure out the future, we want to have a series of little conversations 
where you're revisiting your assumptions about your life and about your resources and about the markets and everything else. You're seeing whether you're still on track and then you're brainstorming, what are some of the the opportunities to improve this plan for myself? Or what are some of the risks that I need to think about mitigating so it doesn't go off course? You're brainstorming those in these little conversations and then you're prioritizing and choosing one of two of those that you're going to actually take action on. Not talk about, not read about, but actually take action on in some very incremental way. And then you take the action and then in the next little conversation, you review the action and see if it's completed or whether you're stuck. And then once you complete them, you celebrate, you say, awesome, give yourself a congratulations. And then you go through the process again, reevaluating everything, brainstorming risks and opportunities, prioritizing, what can I do next? That gives you agency and that helps you make little adjustments as life unfolds. And unfortunately, in traditional retirement planning, it's so cumbersome, you can't really dive into things outside of investments and investment vehicles and the markets and inflation as in depth as you should. So it doesn't feel that engaging. And you don't have conversations about really the things that matter, the things that you can control, the things that give you agency and help you see pathways so you have hope so you can prosper. So we want to have this agile approach where we get to a minimum viable product that we know I have a vision for my future. I see that it's feasible. I've made it sustainable, resilient, and I've done some basic optimization. You just want to get to that. Now, that's what you're going to get to when you get the plan of record. We're going to cover all these things in the weeks to come. And once you have that, then it's having this series of little conversations where you reassess all of that because now you've had this great framework. You reassess all of this fairly quickly and you get to the work of what can I do next? How do I do that? Getting some assistance and accountability, which gives you a quick win. Awesome. Which gives you momentum and you do it again. That's where the wham comes from. How we do this is so critical. Because you're trying to balance having a great life today and having a great life tomorrow. Well, that's like trying to land a plane on an aircraft carrier. Everything's moving constantly. You're in the plane, your life, trying to just have an awesome ride. And you want to make it to the end with enough money, enough fuel. But everything's moving. The boat's moving. You're moving. The wind's moving. Crosswinds are coming. Tailwinds are coming. Headwinds are coming. And you don't want to undershoot it and run out of money, but you don't want to overshoot it either and have so much fuel at the end that you could have had a better ride. And the only way I know how to do that is by having lots of little conversations. And I think traditional planning focuses so much of just getting to the ship that it totally ignores the ride. And the ride is your life. And you don't want to miss that. You want to have confidence that you can do it. And I think mastering these fundamentals will help give you that. So that's what we're going to talk about. So with that, Let's go on and answer some of your listener questions. This show is sponsored by LTCI Partners. They are an independent insurance agency that focuses on long-term care insurance and helping you mitigate the risk of long-term care in your life. They're a partner that I use in my practice when we're evaluating how do we deal with the long-term care insurance risk. And you can go to their website, ltcipartners.com forward slash RAM, and you can get a quote for long-term care insurance. You can see sample rates and they have a lot of great educational videos. So now let's get to some of answering some of your listener questions. If you have questions for the show, You can go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask Roger. We get a lot of questions. I would love to hear your questions, but we work hard to get them on the show, but I can't guarantee that. But we're going to try. I think I feel like I've shortchanged questions a little bit last month. So we'll try to answer more questions this month. So our first question comes from Anne concerning long-term stability of her annuity. So Anne says, my husband at age 60 used some funds from a deferred retirement account to buy a single premium fixed indexed annuity about five years ago, with the intent of turning on joint income at the age of 70, which would guarantee about $700 a month in income. Since he bought the annuity, number one, the person who sold him the annuity is no longer with the bank. 
because they bought it at a local bank. Two is the insurance company no longer sells that particular annuity product. Three, and the insurance company was bought out earlier this year by KKR, a big private equity firm. And now they're going to move to another firm. Now the firm, the annuity company is going to be under a different firm's name. And so Anne says, all this change makes me very nervous about the track record of the new company, whether we can expect the annuity to actually pay out, and wondering whether they should take the cash value at the end of the surrender period, which is in two more years, and roll it into an IRA with the intent to make annual conversions to a Roth. All right, Anne, so what she's referring to in terms of the surrender period is typically these kind of annuities, like this one sounds like has a seven-year surrender charge. And all that means is that there's a sales charge at the end if you get out that goes away, in this case, over seven years. So it sort of locks you into it. So the first thing, Anne, is like, I like that you're thinking about this now because you got two years before you are free without a sales charge. Of all the things that you listed, the only thing that is not necessarily concerning would be, but probably the biggest one of the ones you listed is the fact that it's now under a new company. That's not necessarily a bad thing. There's always a lot of consolidation in these types of companies, these insurance companies. I've seen that over my 30 years. Generally, the ones buying another insurance company are healthier than the one that they're buying, but you can definitely check the credit rating agencies on the insurance company once this all gets cleared out with KKR. So I'm not super concerned about that. The salesman that sold it to you leaving, that's pretty normal. The insurance company no longer selling that particular annuity, that's pretty normal. Annuity contracts are sort of like wine. They have vintages and they constantly are coming out with new products. So I don't think that's particularly concerning. Now, do you cash this out in two years? Really, I don't have an answer for you. My suggestion would be is rather than make a decision solely on all these changes, is to get a plan in place and see how the current annuity fits into that plan in terms of providing income for you and your husband. Because, you know, $700 a month isn't going to cover all of your costs. It will help supplement Social Security. Get that in place. And then you can evaluate with this annuity money, is this the best place relative to what else I could get? And you want to sort of develop what those alternatives are. That way you can compare them. Because until you have a plan of record or the fundamentals done, and you've looked at alternatives for that money, it's going to be really confusing because you don't have any framework to actually make a decision. So I'm glad that you're looking at this for two years. My recommendation would be is start to build that plan of record and then see if it all works with the annuity the way you have it, if you were to turn on the income, and then develop three or four other options for that money. And then you can complete a what is scenario and you can compare which one's better. So I wouldn't worry about all the changes as long as it's a fairly high investment grade annuity company. Our next is from Chin. And it's actually a reaction to Dom's conversation that he had with me about his wife passing. She says, hello, Roger, longtime listener here, trying to plan out the best retirement I can. Looking forward to episodes, explain the pie cake that'll be here in a few weeks. Heard you mention it a couple times, but I didn't understand the concept. So that's why we're doing the fundamentals. So good. But Chin said, I wanted to thank you for interviewing Dom in your last episode. Same thing happened to me. My husband died suddenly from cancer. He was retired and I was next to retire so that we could begin this adventure together. It was healing to hear Dom's interview. Well, I'm sorry, Chin, for your loss. And I'm glad that Dom's perspective helped. And I'm really glad that I hear you talk about continuing on this venture to rock retirement. It's a great way to honor your husband, and it's a great perspective to have. So thanks for the comment, and I'm glad Dom will be able to hear that. And I've gotten a lot of comments, Dom, by the way, of people that were in a similar situation that were really touched and thankful that you were willing to share your journey. So thanks for that. That was Dom. If you didn't listen, it was in mid-January. I don't have the date in front of me. And his wife passed right as they were retiring, and he was willing to have a conversation with me about that so we could hear that perspective. Our next question comes from Merrily. Needs to know about a life insurance benefit retained asset accounts. So Merrily, and I'm reading that correctly, I believe, my husband passed away in September, and I'm sorry to hear that. He had a $250,000 life insurance policy 
I have been given the option to leave the money at the insurance company at a 4% rate with the ability to withdraw part or all of the proceeds at any time. That sounds like a good place to park my money. I do not need the money to live on currently, and I never hear this talked about on any financial podcast. So, Marilyn, I think actually this is a good place to park your money to give yourself a little bit of time to figure out your plan. So I would confirm that it's 4% and you understand how it might vary over time. And I was also confirm with the insurance company that you're not paying any extra fees. You're not locked in to something that you can't unwind or have some big cost on the back end. I would confirm all those things. And if that's the case, then I would say this is a really good option. You're going to earn 4%. Because you're going to need some time. And I've walked this journey with people because you had a retirement adventure planned for the two of you. And if you've been married for some time, it was always a joint plan. And now you're going to have to create your plan. And you probably have some ideas what that is, but you may not know who you are separate from your husband. I know if I had to think of Shauna passing, I don't know who I am without her right now. I mean, I know who I am, but we have our plans. I don't have my plan. So I, th- I would give yourself some time. And I, just, I think this is a good place to be able to park it. Our next question comes from Lori regarding her pension option. So Lori says, hey, Roger, I appreciate your focus on women and Tanya Nichols insights as a special guest. This question may be helpful for any woman who has to make a pension decision. In this case, Lori says, I am six years younger than my husband, and I am the one that will be receiving Social Security and a pension. And I have to determine my pension payout options. When reading online, it seems that the guidance is pretty generalized and always assuming that the male who is older is the one with the pension option. In this case, it's very reversed. I'm six years younger and I'm the one with the pension option. So do you have any rules of thumb to help guide my decision? So that's an interesting question, Laura. And you make a good point that generally it's assuming that it's the male with the pension option and that they're older than the female and trying to protect for the longest potential lifespan. In your case, you're the younger one by six years, and you still have the longest projected life expectancy between the two of you, one because of age and the other because of gender. Now, you say that you've examined the options and the difference between the single life annuity, which would only pay for your life, and the 100% survivor annuity, which would go for both you and your husband, regardless of who went live longer, is about $210 per month or about $2,500 a year. So that's not a huge differential between the two very different options from uh, how long it potentially could pay out. You also say that the pension has a bounce back feature to a single life pension if he predeceases you. And that's something unique. I don't think I've seen that before. So very interesting there. So how do you go about figuring this out? Well, The different options that you're being offered are actuarially equal, assuming you both live to normal life expectancy. So they're meant to equal out based on your ages, et cetera. But when choosing the pension option, it's really important to sort of know what you do know and what you don't know when you're trying to navigate this. And then obviously, one, you know both your ages. You know that you are female, he is male, which means that you're likely to have a much longer life expectancy than he is. You also know the health condition for each of you relatively, right? You know if either of you have chronic illnesses or if you're both healthy, so that can factor into your decision. And you can also know how important the pension option is within the context of everything else you have from a financial plan. And I think you also make mention in your note about potentially taking a cash option and using a private annuity to create a payout stream. So my first thought would be the rule of thumb is generally, Lori, every time I've looked at this, the vast majority of times, the annuity you can get from the pension plan is going to far outweigh what you can get in the private market. So I'd be very careful about doing that. Secondly, given the differential and how small it is, I would probably lean more to doing the joint life option, especially since it has this bounce back feature. But I think you're on the right track and you make a really good point when, in terms of what do you do if it's a younger woman that has the pension 
with an older husband. And I think you want to always focus on how do we create, use this asset to create lifetime income given the probabilities for the longest lifespan. I think that definitely makes the case. And then that's definitely the case here, excuse me. And then also look at the differential between what is it as single and what is it as a joint life. So I think you're on the right track there. And with that, let's go set a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to take a little baby step you can take in the next seven days to not just rock retirement, but rock life. So in the next seven days, I want you to just grab a piece of paper and think about the last retirement plan meeting that you had, whether it's with a financial planner, if you use one, or whether it's you and your spouse or you on your own, just the last time you really updated all this. That probably wasn't that long ago, given that it's just the beginning of March. And on that piece of paper, I want you to divide between two columns, left and right. And on one side, I want you to write can't control, and the other side can control. And I want you to review in your head the meeting that you had on your retirement plan and put down the things that you discussed and put them into categories of you can control it or you can't control it. Inflation, if you spent 20 minutes talking about inflation and where it's going to go and what the experts are saying, that's probably under a can't control. If you are talking about specific steps you can take to help hedge inflation, perhaps it's buying I-bonds or making adjustments to your portfolio, that's something you can control. Same thing, market expectations and where we think the economy is going, that's something you can't control or predict. How you're diversifying your pie cake to help meet short-term needs as well as have money growing for the long-term, well, that's something you can control. The point of the exercise is to do a debrief on the kind of retirement plan meetings you're hosting with yourself or with your advisor to make sure you're focusing on the things that you can actually control because that's where you have the most power and that's where you can work to take little baby steps to rock retirement. Even after eight years of doing these, I think this month is the eighth year anniversary of the show. Believe it or not, this is my third take at doing this episode. I did it once the other day. I did it once earlier today, and I didn't really feel that good about it. Maybe those were the better ones. I don't know. They felt like I was just rambling. Sometimes I feel like I'm just rambling, and maybe that's what happens when you're in a room with a microphone by yourself. You'd think after eight years, it would just be so easy, right? And the reason I retook it is because sometimes I feel like I'm trying to get across what I want to say to you. And I definitely have things I want to express to you and help guide you, but I never want to make it be about what I have to say. I always want this show to be about you and think to help you on your journey and focus on the dreams and the challenges that you're facing and help give you a framework or tool to do it just a little bit better. That's my goal for this, so that's why I did a third take, and hopefully this one hit the spot. Hope you're having a great week, and we'll talk next week. Hey, it's time for that all-important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually, it helps us too. But remember, you're not our client. We would not love it if you took advice from yeah, us on we the would show. Not, we would not love it if you took advice from us on the show. Realize this is helpful in some education. Talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of Retirement Answer Man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.